Look on the stands up. Why does the girl have to test me how far she can go? Because she cares about her. As communicated by what? It would be specific. In other words, if this girl is saying, I want to test to see how far I can go, I'll do a certain something, and I'll expect a certain kind of behavior, and then I'll know that I'm cared about. What kind of thing do you think she was looking for? How was she testing? Uh, the girls always In regard to what, though? Uh, in, to many things. How can they manipulate them? How, how far can they uh, get away with uh, certain Why? Things? What does that, what does that communicate? It's not like trying to see how much they can trust them, whether it's in terms of I can trust that person to always go against me or I can trust that person. That's always the, the basic thing that is there. Mm -hmm. uh, the basic feeling is with a new person or with a new environment, they get very scared. Because in any situation they're not familiar, they don't know what to expect. And you are most vulnerable when you don't know what to expect. But for some of the girls, they, they hate the back room, sometimes even worse than the cell. Uh, they may be more familiar with the cell sometimes. They, they hate the uh, unfamiliar. So sometimes what they're really saying is, if I'm going to feel secure with you, a new person, I've got to know how you're going to respond when I act my worst. Other times it is, as you indicate, a test of how much do you care about me, meaning how much will you bend the rules for me? Because caring means that you will somehow go a little bit out of your way for me. I feel that I'm cared about only if you'll make an exception in my case. You know, I'm special to you. And they all want to be very special more so than the other girls. If the officer sees it as a test, she's going to get very stern and say, you're not going to push me around. Because once you label it as a test, you see, we're not seeing it then from their point of view. We're seeing it from our own uh, challenge point of view. I'm new here. I'm not going to goof. You see, no one's going to exploit me and push me around. I'm going to stand up for the limits. It doesn't mean we shouldn't stand up for the limits. But sometimes the way we approach it then, if we understand what's going on in the girl, we may have to then set the limits and say, I'm sorry, these are the rules, but I can understand why you want me to do this for you. Many ways I wish though I could. Maybe sometimes it will be appropriate. <coughs> now it's not. But if we, if we see it only as a test, we feel angry about that. The nerve you've got to test me. You see? Especially when I'm so new and I don't know my way around. You see? Well, it's so a insecure. personal threat. How dare you? I'm so insecure. Yes. You see, the newness of the officer and her insecurity out of her normal accepting self, she responds out of the fear and out of the anger that rises from the fear. See, in, in that building over in the old this, this happened. See, they had uh, two officers that were new to them, like Miss Hayden and myself. Yeah. And, uh, oh, that it has been all kinds of little picky, picky, picky things, like uh, when you go into a new building. I'm sure, just like you must have felt comfortable when you came, when somebody sat down with you and told you perhaps what's expected of you. Because they didn't tell me. That, that must <laughs> so have made I you more insecure. Learn. Right. To learn to trial and error. That maybe tell us something about how we need to respond if we have a new officer, perhaps has to come in and sit down with the girls and say, look, girls, this is what I expect from you. Because once the girls have some clear notion of what the person stands for and what they expect, they don't feel so terribly uncertain. They get more scared having to tread in unknown waters. So they, they pick on here and pick on there to find out what their officer is going to do. But if the officer sits down at the very beginning 
and says, these are the things that I'll tolerate, these are the things that I want, if you treat me this way, I'll treat you that way. And the girls have a sense of expectancy. It's not at all a confusion anymore. These are very insecure little kids, and when they don't know what to expect, they have to then test to find out, because they're sure they're not going to make a mistake, and they get clobbered very hard. So they'll pick here and pick there. So we've got to take the time to let them know what we expect, and to also expect them to somehow push here and there to find out whether we'll stand up or not. How consistent are we? And after they've had their testing period, uh, and they know we're consistent, they know what to expect from us, they usually will fall away. If we're inconsistent, they get very unhappy and very frightened, uh, and then they may probably push us some more. So just like we've got to tell our officers, I think, what is expected of them, I think we've got to tell the girls what's expected of them every time a new officer comes in and they feel so terribly unfamiliar. You have to readjust. Yeah. Sure. So a lot of the girls who have been on the streets all their lives, or much of their lives, have never had to adjust and cope to any kind of uh, limits and rules and regulations. And they come to a situation with all kinds of rules and limits and regulations. And it's not always easy for them to adjust, yet we sometimes expect them to adjust very quickly. But it's not even easy for us to make that adjustment very easily. The ability to cope and to adjust is, of course, reflective of our own maturity. In fact, we can change our perception of things, and change our approach. It's one of the things we want to teach these girls, that there's more than one way to deal with life, to deal with people. That just to mistrust everybody, just because you couldn't trust your mommy and daddy. That they must learn discrimination as to who you can trust and who you can't. And who you can look for help from and who you can't. It's lumping everybody into the same boat. All authority figures can't be trusted. All people over 30 can't be trusted. All people can't be trusted. Now, the whole generalizing effect, they have never learned to discriminate. That's the problem. We do it because it's safer. Because if you mistrust none of them, you can't get hurt. So we've got to change that generalization effect to help them understand it is true that there are many people in the world you can't trust. Many people like to hurt. Many people will never love them and care about them. But the problem comes not in that fact. The problem comes in that generalizing to all people. And not learning how to discriminate. Because when you know how to discriminate, you feel safer and secure. You know who to trust and who not to trust, and then you feel more secure. If you can't make a discrimination, you feel very paranoid, because you don't know that you can trust anybody. So you feel surrounded by assassins. Whatever you do, uh, somebody can do you in. In fact, you feel most vulnerable whenever you're tempted to trust. You see, whenever somebody comes along that seems so nice and sweet and kind and understanding, and something you want to trust, you know, because you need that relationship so badly. That's when you get most frightened, because when you start to trust is when you can get most hurt. So then they start to push the person away, whatever way they do it, you see? Because that's when they're most vulnerable. And we sometimes don't understand that. You know, I've been so nice to her, how could she treat me this way? Never understanding that. You made a statement about um, young children being Difficult question to answer. Uh, it's always better, I think, if it is the mother, but it really doesn't have to be, as long as it's truly a loving person, someone who truly loves the child and truly uh, does care enough to be there to listen when the child is hurt physically or psychologically, to talk it out and to show understanding of the child's feelings. Uh, if there is such a person there consistently, uh, security will be there. 
but it, it isn't very easy for persons other than the parents to have that kind of loving involvement and concern, but theoretically it's possible. Which is too bad, actually. You know, yeah. this whole expanded family idea, and we used to live with grandma yeah. and right. and yeah. then now, today, in the nuclear family, this one young mother who perhaps has never been exposed to a child in her life suddenly has this dependent human being, and she's supposed to be super mother. She has no way of knowing how to do this at all. You know, now what am I going to do? You know, this kid falls down. Yeah. Needs how, how perceptive that is. It's so true. Especially with the first child, catches all the brunt of the mother's insecurity. The more yeah. insecure she gets, the more angry she yeah. gets, blaming it on the child. Uh. What are you doing crying at 3 o'clock in the morning? I mean, <laughs> what have I done that's been so terrible as a mother? It made me feel so inadequate. You know, it's I, even worse when the husband has to get up in the, in the morning yeah. and go to work, and he's saying, can't you keep that kid quiet? Yeah, that's know? really <laughs> the only way that works. You can't even both sides. Yeah, and then we wonder why we have, uh, you know, uh, depression after childhood that's right. and the whole kind of thing. And my theory in that is that when the mother needs the mothering the most, she gets nothing. How true. You know, like yeah. all during your pregnancy, you're going, how are you feeling? Here, sit down. Let me help you. And then the baby comes, yeah. and when you're frazzled and up at four or five times in the night, yeah. then the baby is everything, and nobody thinks about getting you a meal. And there's a whole right. theory about doulas, women in Spain who used to come and spend specifically time with the mother yes. and make sure that things in the family went well so that the mother and the baby could get acquainted. And it's sort of like mothering the mother. That's very it's true. Very oh, yeah. it's so necessary. We don't have that. Especially for the young mother. Because the, the young mother isn't really totally. It's really a slow pace of life. Oh, yeah. But I'm saying the principle behind mm -hmm. having the mother mothers because so often we don't get that in our society. Yeah, you see, the truth is everybody needs a mother. So when the woman becomes a mother, she's no longer free to be a child anymore. Yeah. She becomes a mother to the man as well. That's right. She wants to be a mother to everybody. She's she's yeah. mother of the universe. That's right. <laughs> she has no chance to be the child anymore and to be mothered. And some are very young, you know, and they still need to be able to regress and get refueled themselves sometimes. Once you become a mother, you have no right to be weak. You're right. sick, you yeah. out and make, <laughs> make food for the kids. Anyway. That's right. Uh, a rock of Gibraltar. If you're a mother, right? A mother or a Latinx soul. Yes. Then what is, is really happening is that whole theory of TA, how everybody has some parent in them, some adult in them, and some child. Yes, everybody Which is saying when, when a mother becomes a mother, she's no longer allowed to be her free child, her rebellious child. She's <laughs> only allowed to be a nurturing parent or a critical parent or an adult. Wow, what a rip-off. That, is, that, that really isn't fair. No. She has no right to be weak, no right to be helped. She's got to be strong under all circumstances. Yeah. If people are falling apart emotionally, she's got to be there as a strong mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Physically, she's got to be the nurse. And she's right in the middle. Yeah, there's her daughter and there's yeah. her mother. And she's yeah. born. Yeah, from the mother. And, and not like that, you know, the thing that you mentioned earlier was how our culture so so does this. Have you read Women in Madness? Which is Phyllis Chesler's book. She's a woman really psychologist. Should. Incredible. And she she does this whole research and theory on exactly this kind of thing. That our society sets us up to be mothers, and all of a sudden our kids are gone. And our needs, what are we? You know, all of a sudden, if you had a career and you've been in the home maybe for 20 years, in our society, homemaking is a sort of valueless profession, which it should not be. You know, because it certainly is not an easy job, and it's very low underpaid. And, under uh, the <laughs> But you know, it's sort of like like this is setting you up. The society again is setting you up for a rip off because when you get to be forty years old and your kids are all gone, you look around and say, Now, um, you know, I got another twenty, thirty years left. What do I do now? Yes. Except, you know, turn some kind of escape, whatever it may be. Yes, you're right. The uh, society sure. says uh, you must all have a sense of worth. It says as a mother you get a sense of worth out of being needed and by being a mother. Now, if you're no longer a mother, where do you get your sense of worth from? The society doesn't say you're worthy unless proven otherwise. It says you are worthless unless proven otherwise. Yeah. You must earn your sense of worth. Yeah. So if I don't have my kids, how do I earn my sense of worth? Yeah. You know, where are my skills and so forth? Yeah. So it's unfortunate that many societies, in a sense, one is intrinsically worthwhile. You have to prove your worthlessness. Yeah. 
Here, you really are proven to be worthless unless you've proven yourself to be worthwhile in some avenue of endeavor. And for the mother, that's a very difficult thing to do, because what is she to do sure. when she no longer is needed? Sure, consider the women that are addicted that have children have not really been able to handle all that. And they get into drugs, or they were probably into drugs before anyway, but uh, I know people that have had children, gone and kicked a habit through methadone maintenance or whatever, kicked a heroin habit, and gotten pregnant, or rather kicked the habit because they were pregnant, expect great expectations that the child is going to change their whole life, and they have the child, and it's, oh, it's terribly restricting and confining yes. to them, and they can't even begin to deal with it. Yeah. So that's where they We're fall right back into the whole drug thing. thing. It's just this fantastic thing, like, like it's playing house. Yeah. Like you can put your dolls away, and you can't put children can't away. Put the dolls children are people, and they're there for 20 or 30 years, forever, actually. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. a very, it's a whole other thing of what our societal values do to yeah. do to us as young children when we're growing up. Say, oh wow, you know, like when I get to be 40 years old and I'm married, and all of a sudden my kids are all, I've got to have another baby now. No, to make it oh, yeah. yes, work. Yes, wild. yes. I've yeah. got to do this because it's the yeah. only way I can create and feel useful. That's right. That's mm -hmm. Very often true. I, I think society really makes my head. Mm -hmm. This is how I felt. <clears throat> we were married several years ago. Everywhere we went, well, how come you don't have children? Yeah. And I'm yourself and say, I don't yes. want children. And then look at me as if I had three green hairs or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I was wrong, you know. I, you know. Yeah. It just, it, it was a terrible pressure on us, really, mm -hmm. until we did have our children. Yeah. And then you were all right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. We were we fixed. You were, in. You know, yeah. we were yeah. in. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think yeah. that yeah. 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 it was really a, a wake-up call for me. Yeah. Yeah. And then Nothing wrong than nothing worse than having children who really aren't ready for it. No, we waited quite a long. I'm glad we did. But, uh, and when you're ready for it, it's a marvelous experience. I don't think I don't think oh, I was ready. Sure. I haven't got everything ready for it because yeah. I went through it. But I even those, yeah. I never even wanted children until the doctor told me I couldn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, that's exactly it. Really, and that's what was the matter with me. I can't yeah. believe well, I did. Yeah. yeah. But I really can't say that I ever felt this terrible. Sure, sure. <laughs> Not until and why should one have to? Why should you have to be yeah. to prove your worthwhelness? You to prove that, that you're the same. Yeah. Right. Of course. That's I another mean, expectation that's right laid on women. Yeah. Right. Is, is you're not worthwhile unless you can reproduce. Right. People do put an awful lot of pressure yeah, what? on you. If you're still single by the time you're 30, yeah. my God, what's the matter yeah. with you? You know, oh, you're yes. trying to be married to be. Yeah. But you know the reverse is also true, where there is not pressure on girls to have a career. If you haven't got a career, what's wrong with you? You must be stupid or something. Yeah. Not wanting to go out into the world and have a career. You mean you're going to stay at home and lose yourself there? You must be stupid. So there's sometimes a pressure in the other direction. I think it's much well. less uh, pressure from that extent because every time you see TV ads, you see women scrubbing. Perpetuating baby carriage or shopping carts. So that kind of pressure is can nowhere compare to the amount of programming that you've had from the time zero to twenty when you get to the time where you might have a career. No, you know, you know and you at least should have an alternative. Choice. There should be an alternative. You should do whatever you want to do. In well, addition to that, school. Okay, your kids are getting yeah. into high school now. What do they plan to do beyond school? Oh, they can go to Chino Pino. Well, it's not much here. Well, it's fun. Yeah, I really can. Yeah. I really can see where some people would would really turn to drugs because they're not able to live up to their parents' expectations, yes. you're yeah. not married by the time you're yeah. 30, or you don't have a career that you're making good money and you're yeah. really into it, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You know, and then the, then the person feels like, there is you something wrong with me. Yeah. Yes. You know, and yes. I don't like myself very well because I'm not living up to what should be. Yes. Or, or, yeah. 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 Your baby brother, who's five yeah. years younger than you, was always a good boy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But actually, some kids reverse the whole process, mm -hmm. and they say that whole value system doesn't mean anything. You see, no job means anything. Mm -hmm. Right. None of that means anything. They yeah. reverse the whole thing where uh, the uh, necessity becomes a virtue. So that who needs school and who needs marriage and who needs working and who needs any of that? So some of the whole thing is reversed mm -hmm. also. The pressure, though, I would think even if a person wants to be a mother and enjoys it, yet to have to do it every single day and every weekend and every holiday, every and never have holiday. a chance to really be by yourself, to hear what's going on within yourself, I think the whole role of motherhood uh, somehow imprisons a person, even though they really love what they're doing. You need a break. Well, that's when grandmothers come in handy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. <laughs> they don't indulge too much. But they don't indulge the kids too much. Grandmothers are for spoiling. Yes, you must listen to yourself sometimes. You must I think objection to the word is trapped. Mm -hmm. I have two daughters, and there's nobody enjoys them anymore than I do. Not trapped. And there's no, <laughs> way, no way that we would go without them. They are part of us, and they're part of a way of life. What That's I'm saying true. is, though, when your and children are very right. small, and the woman is in the home, for example, and, and the child is waking up, you know, like every three, four hours in the middle of the night, if you do need a little break from that. Even if it's, if it's your husband or your mother or somebody can come and do that. Well, I don't think that's a good idea. I, I really think it's, it's, even, it's even important for sometimes for husbands and wives to, take to be able to be away from each other because otherwise, oh. otherwise it may become an addiction or a dependency too where one is now afraid to be wild by oneself. There's too much emptiness now, too many bad thoughts and feelings. One then uses the family, the children or the husband. Whereby one shouldn't obviously reject the husband or the children very often, but uh, I think each of us needs a chance to face the honesty of what's going on within ourselves. Otherwise, uh, when the kids are gone or the husband is gone or whatever, there's a tremendous, uh, you know, tremendous loss and emptiness and difficulty in adjustment to make. Rest of the day. I know. But for some women, it's still this is my chance to do my housework or to catch up with my sorrow or my ironing or something. <laughs> they don't know how to get away from any of that. Read, you write, you study, you do more things. You don't talk. You do. Oh. I mean, everybody does. Unless I was in the country that I get once in a while, and I went through the years to make that bread. I didn't realize I went to the rock. I thought that I was the only one that did that. I work over in some place where I won't put money in the house. No house gets cleaned. No, I just. Yes. That's interesting, isn't oh, it? Yeah. Just a That's about the no, least adequately prepared. People are prepared, no matter what they feel about, they're prepared. Yes. Parenthood, which is actually the most important. Yes. Mm -hmm. For men and for women, for that matter. Right. Yeah. yeah. Why do you right. suppose that's true? No separation of yes. I think it's just a lot of Absolutely true. <laughs> Put it aside, really. And it's all important to have the child and ask for the child. Who cares? You get the child. Who cares? I know when I get my child. I was in the hospital seven days, and the doctor came in, and he said, Sonny, what's the matter? And he couldn't go home. And I just looked at him, I said, I don't even know how to play for you. And that's more typical than mm -hmm. the other way around. Sure is. Yeah. And how scared you must have been, and I think so many women must be. A new child, they're kind of young themselves. So many things are demanded of them about being perfect mothers. They have no training. They don't know what to expect. And they get this tremendous responsibility, tremendous job. 
they must think somehow that women are, are superhuman. Mm-hmm. The, the motherly instinct will somehow come out and take care of everything. Which is not the, the rest. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I was just thinking just in the actual physical giving birth. Oh, you know, yeah. you just, if you're a woman, you're expected to know what's going to happen. Yeah. And, and the majority yeah. of the moms who really doesn't, and it's a tremendous joy you feel. Yes. You know, not knowing what to how right that is. No, it's just that. You can bring it all the way back even to the act of, of sexuality, of getting pregnant. Really, there are a lot of girls that have been promiscuous even and have no idea what conception is all about. I have no idea what orgasm is all about. Yeah. It's very interesting that we can show our children war and killing and murder on TV. Yeah. It's perfectly acceptable for anything sexual. Yeah. Any sex education. Mm-hmm. That, that is so... Oh, no, absolutely yeah. not. The man is supposed to know everything there is about sex. Nobody ever taught him. If no. the woman knows, then she's been promiscuous. She's not yeah. supposed to tell yeah. you. That's so they go 50 years into marriage and nobody ever knows what's happening. What a contradiction that is. Wow. Yeah. That's so true. What a contradiction that is. Yet uh, we build up motherhood in this country, but we give yeah. the girls no training. The guys certainly no training. Right. Men are really helpless. They can't yeah. even change a diaper. Yeah. You need no more than any woman. Because neither one of them get any training. And why that's so is an incredible thing to understand. <laughs> You know, you never been in a spot mm. where you're the age where you had to help, you know. But if you were the youngest one, you still stuck. Well, or why not, you know, if we're going to teach kids something, why not have some courses related to happy marriage? Not just raising children, but how do people get along together? How do you deal with conflict when it arises? How do you relate with children when you have them? How do you live with somebody? How do you just live with somebody? I yeah. Know. Yeah. Oh, we educate <laughs> kids with nothing to do with life at all. Yeah. It's an exactly. amazing thing. Yeah. Just your life in there. And it's amazing, even all and throughout the PhD, whatever it is, yeah. depending what your major is. Yeah. Okay, you still have nothing to do with common sense, Absolutely. practical, everyday yeah. living, and other people's human emotional interaction, mm-hmm. and kind of you know freedom to be able yeah. to discuss. Education is too far removed from reality. Yes. Terribly uh-huh. far removed from the realistic necessity things we really have to be proficient at. Right. Uh-huh. It's incredible. You see in movies and on TV and different stories and so forth about when a couple is getting ready to get married and they portray the groom as being very, very nervous and, yeah. and the bridegroom is being, the bride rather, as being very nervous. That I think is very realistic. Yes, that's right. Sometimes <laughs> they, they don't... Should be, they should be... Yeah, they should be scared yeah, to death. Yeah. I mean, you know, really, going into sure. a... That's why I think people shouldn't go out and marry. Live together, yeah. yeah. It's less yeah. dramatic. Yeah. At least you don't have to take that final leave and then have your children yeah. and grow up and then go away. Yes. Oh, we still don't know how to raise children. Not only that, you know. Yeah. Not only that too. There's also the problem that without without the marriage, there is no commitment to face conflict. Because as soon as conflict is very heavy, it's very easy to split and to go find somebody else. So one never really deals with conflict. A lot of people never deal with conflict anyway. Whether it's true. Piece of paper or not. What is a piece of paper anyway? You can still leave anything anymore. Well, once they look at their marriage as a piece of paper, that's what they've got. Yes, of course, but he's saying if you, if you, you know, if you have a commitment to stay together with this piece of I paper, I think it might make you stop, stop and think twice right. more than you. Yeah, the idea being, once you've made the commitment, we are going to stay together. We might as well be happy. So if we've got conflict. We're going to have to work it out because we're going to have to live together. So we better sit down and start talking. If there's no commitment that we're going to have to live together. There's no need to face the conflict. That can also work in reverse, however. If you do not have a commitment, then you know that both of you at any time are able to split. Yes. So therefore, you work much harder. The relationship's good. Yes, but not always honest. In other words, you say, if I am uh, uh, angry yeah. with you, uh, yeah. and I'm afraid you're going to split, if I tell you the truth, I won't have a fight with you, I just won't tell you. you well, that can be the same way if you're married. It can be, quite often yeah, it is. Sure. But there's a commitment there to resolve conflict. And this is part of the problem. That these kids have never learned to resolve conflict. They run from yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, most of us don't know how to teach them how to resolve conflict, because we too run from conflict. There's no course in school that teaches uh, the conflict can be dealt with. Conflict How about is the reality. marriage and the family courses, you know, like something? Parent effectiveness no. courses. They're given nice. by people really themselves. Well, they don't know what they're doing. No, they're very naive. <laughs> uh, in fact, even many physicians don't know anything about sex. Oh, well, obviously. Really. And they know nothing about the counseling couples with right. regard to sexuality, of raising children, uh, or anything like that. They don't get that. Yeah. No, they don't get that training.
So we get the uh, we get those kids that have been traumatized <laughs> because of lack of learning. <laughs> Kids have gone out into the world, you know, and they haven't been able to adjust, and we get them here. And we've done the optimal classes in school as well, for parents and children. In high Some of them are. Parents keep working it up. Well, most of them are very superficial, really. Really? Oh, yeah. Many, so many people object to them. Yes. yes. My yeah, that's just like... Parents. And when they flunk, you see, then we get them here. And we're expecting yeah, some kind of miracle of re-education, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important to treat people with a certain amount of dignity, like you're saying. Yeah. People are all individual people, and that's the basic problem. I, I went to hear Dr. Glass, who's a psychiatrist in the West Coast that wrote School Without Failure. And he was saying how years ago it used to be that you had to depend, okay, I've got to eat, I've got to find my food, and that was your basic need. Today, somebody's going to feed you, you're going to eat. He yeah. said, basically, who am I? You know, do people notice me? Do they care about me? How am I different than everybody else? And this is your basic need now. Changing world. But people need to know this kind of thing. Yeah. And it's important. And I think that's also, you know, spills over into their your attitudes and, and how you relate to a human being. How what your, your vocabulary, your usage. And I was just wondering, for example, you call, I don't know, everybody seems to call these women girls. Is that because should you, be women. Do you call the men at, when, uh, when at the Men's Correctional Center boys half the time? At the prison they're called men, but we are. We yeah. should not. We should say women. Yes. Mm. Or as one gentleman <coughs> pointed out, they're prisoners. Some, some of them are mothers, some of them are yes. adults. But you know, something that prisoners. keeps you in that, you, we're saying act mature. Yes. Be adults. Yes. Uh, make mature decisions, but yeah, we call them girls. And that's yes. sort of makes them below 13 suddenly. They have a yes. rich no, but oh yes. look. Oh, they react to that. Yeah. A group yeah. of women that are 55 years old are going to say, great, we girls are going to get together back to me. That's yeah. all programmed. <laughs> <laughs> that, that girls are, are, you know, childlike. Yes. So that makes you feel good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a booster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you've got a thing about your age, yeah. I think we made a mistake in calling you. Yeah, we get conditioned by the fact that not only they're very young sometimes chronologically, but emotionally they're so young. Yes. But I'll tell you the reverse is also true, that a lot of girls, if you call them women, will rebel because they're not ready to be women. They, they don't like the responsibility of it, the fear of it. We may like it because of our own feeling, but a lot of them are very fearful of the responsibility of, the mature, of what goes along with the maturity and will rebel against it even if you try to encourage it. Yeah, we should call Chris and uh, Chris Messman a uh, woman. Doesn't mean we shouldn't call them that. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, that's not the point. I think yeah. the point that you're making is very valid. Mm -hmm. That they might not want to assume that responsibility. Sure. They might be a little afraid of it. However, it is a sort of a positive kind of a thing. It, it, they are adults, yeah. And certain adults, yeah, yeah, it's right. Right. But the issue is why do we do it? We do it because sometimes we have to seem like the authority. If you call them a woman, then it becomes a one-to-one -one equality relationship. Yeah, and that doesn't satisfy oh, anyone. Yeah, then we can't be authority anymore. Mm. So. Makes them Well, that's like the same theory about first name basis. You know, okay, why, why Doctor So and So will call his patient John? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so then you know the whole theory that goes behind that. What are, what are the doctor's needs? Who can be called doctor and call the patient John? Yeah. Every time my dentist calls me by my first name, I call him Fred. Yes. He gets very upset about that. Yes. The um, it's a nurse condescending. Nurse, I'm a nurse. They can send me in you know, Maryland. But Dr. Jones, you know, and I don't do that. I say hey, Fred. You know, they look at me and they can't stand it. You know, it's like. What is this woman doing calling me Fred? You know, I'm, I'm up here somewhere. I've worked for 10 years to get my... Yeah, I've worked yeah. for my authority <laughs> position. Yeah. yeah, and I said, okay, honey, I work five, six for mine. That's okay. And those days are gone when, you know, I hand you your tray. And, yes. and that's it, because things have changed. And they have to but there has to be a consistency, too, that if we decide that we can call these, uh, these females women, mm -hmm. we may have to treat them like that, too. But there has to be a kind of consistency that goes along with saying what we're interested in is in changing their perception of themselves. Of and if they change their perception of themselves, they're going to act in ways in accord with that self-concept. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm. if we're going to treat them like mature women because we want them to act like it, because they're going to have to act like it in order to adjust in the world out there, right. then we have to 
call them differently, we have to treat them differently, we have to expect more mature kinds of things from them. And I think uh, you get them. That's a whole expectation yeah. of behavior kind of thing. Yes. If you can expect somebody to act up, they probably will. Yes. Yeah. You expect the worst, you get the worst. Oh, you're always in trouble. And and they're they're up to, sure, that was where I was at. <laughs> oh, there she goes. She's getting locked up again. Right on. I sure am. True. Sure. Expect that all the time. Uh huh. Sure. sure. Had to live up to my bad image. Right. Because you have to be a somebody, and they're going to see the worst, yep. you're going to be the worst. Let's well, see the best. This is this shows up very clearly in some of my women in their history. Well, you're just a whore like Aunt Eunice. Sure. Because I'm going to be. That's right, that they're going to be. Whatever they oh, label yeah. as being. We are all labels of but ourselves. But it's such a shock to people when you change that. Somebody's used to being yelled at and screamed at, and all of a sudden you talk to them and say, okay, you know, like you were saying, recognize their existence, yeah. you know, by, it's like uh, Heim the Knotts theory, you know, like the mother comes in and she always makes the same soup, and the kid sits down, I don't like this kind of soup, and if the mother says, what's the matter with my soup, you know yeah. it's my soup, I always make it the same, then the, then the hooker's out and everybody's off to battle, but if she says, oh, you don't like the soup. Well, the kid said what he wanted to say. She recognized that he said what he wanted to say, and they all eat their meal. <laughs> you know? And it, it's done deliberately, but you still recognize what that person says and their value as a human being. Yes. Because they have a right to say, "Look, I'm angry because of what I feel." Yes. Mm -hmm. But we can do that only if we're not personally threatened. <laughs> yes. If we have to be the good yes. cook and the good mother, then you have the right to say these things to me. If I have to be the authority here and I have to be a good officer, yes. you have the right to tell me I'm mistreating you or something. Like that. So they have a lot to learn, but we have a lot to learn, too. And hopefully we can learn together. None of us are perfect. Uh, but as long as we're open to learning, I think we can teach each other an awful lot. Mm -hmm. That's another whole thing. It's being willing to be open and say, gee, you know, I don't really know. Let me go ask somebody, you know. Because we have to some feel like we have to know everything. Yeah. And we have to be the final authority figure. And say, look, let's mm -hmm. talk it over. How do you all feel? And girls sometimes feel worthless if they think somehow that the officer always has to be right. Mm -hmm. You know, and they feel somehow by contrast that they're always uh, wrong. They're always wrong. Where if the officer can accept the fact that sometimes they're wrong, the girls can start accepting the fact that they're wrong sometimes mm -hmm. too. Sure, and there's an element of respect that is developed as a result of that too. I think. Yes, it does. It's courage to be able yeah. to. Yeah. Make a mistake. Yeah. Yes, I'm yeah. not perfect. Which means that you can make a mistake too. It's easier to say than sure. trying to come wrong. This very same thing happened. And I did it. And one of the girls was saying, you know, who is the so-and-so that did this, mm. you know? And I said, well, I did. And, you know, it was just, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I was a mistake, you know. And just calm, nothing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just nothing. <laughs> well, that, it was a so-and-so, you know? Yeah. So it's really interesting just to watch. I, was, I thought they'd say something else, but nothing else. Because you came out and said I did. Too heavy for him, I think. So yeah, I'm sure they were so blown away. That's why you got nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? It's really just quiet. Yeah, too heavy. <laughs> Dr. Hammer, if you could give, if you had the power, shall we say, to give everybody here a, pres a prescription, if you could write out a prescription for us all. And we could take it out and get it filled, and we could make use of it. Um, what would that prescription consist of? Yeah. In terms of helping the women here with whatever problems, whether they're drug problems, the fact that they're here, whatever. OK, I'd be glad to react to that. Uh, it's a very interesting kind of question. Uh, and whatever I say, you ought not to take that as being necessarily the truth. Uh, you must do what you have to do. Before I respond to that, though, um, I think, without begging that question, I really think it's always a mistake to follow uh, the authority of anybody other than your own understanding. Because if you do something without your own personal understanding, it becomes a meaningless kind of thing to do. <coughs> if I may say something and you see the truth of it, it becomes something different. But quite often we read books, you know, and it says, well, we should behave to our children so-and-so, we should behave to our husbands so-and-so, and, so and, so and, so and 
girls here in so and so fashion. Behavior toward other people cannot be a programmed kind of thing. It cannot be a routine kind of thing because human beings are creative, living kinds of things. And therefore, nobody can really ever tell you that this is how you must behave and this is what you must do. Why? Because there's no room for creativity and change in a program, in any kind of patterning. So from that point of view, I would never tell you, in a sense, what to do, except, hopefully, for you to be you. Now, what that means, really, is if you can really learn to self-accept yourself, the more that you can learn to accept yourself, the more are you really able to hear other people and learn to accept other kinds of people. The less you accept in yourself, the more intolerant you really become of other people. So no matter what I tell you to do, you really can't act on it. It doesn't make any sense. Then, in a sense, you only feel more guilty if I say you should behave so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, for example, um, loving another human being is not a set of behaviors anyway. You know, there are many counselors in school that tell the mothers, you know, and say, well, you should love your child more. So somehow loving is something you do in behavior. Uh, loving is a feeling of warmth that comes from understanding. Now, how do you understand another person? By being able to hear them. And how are you able to hear them? By being sensitive enough to yourself to take time to listen to what's going on within you. Because if you become insensitive to yourself so that you don't hear the painful truth of yourself, you take that insensitivity and you project it out and you really can't hear what's going on in the others. And if we really can't hear what's going on in these kids, it doesn't make a difference what we do. Because we can then start acting considerately, and the acting considerately is not the same as being considerate. And the act of caring is not the same as being caring. Um, so I don't really want to give you any kind of prescription. Uh, I would say if you can be a real whole person, you can admit your mistakes, and you can be real, and show your caring when it's there, and show your anger when it's there too, but be able to perhaps share and explain why you feel that way, because everyone has a right to be angry, and it's going to deal with those realities. If you can be a spontaneous whole person and all, not hold anything back, they can learn to maybe start accepting more of themselves. Because unless, they, unless we can change the girl's perception or concept of themselves, they haven't changed. Because the person's behavior is always dependent upon their self-concept. Therefore, if a girl leaves here hating herself and feeling that she's no good, a behavior is always going to try to confirm the self-concept. Because I am my self-concept, and my behavior will always be to confirm that. So if I'm a worthless, no good human being, as I see myself, my behavior will always be that. So if we're going to get these girls to change their concepts of themselves, we're going to have to help them to learn to look at themselves and accept themselves better. And the only way we can do that really is when we learn to accept ourselves better. Um, and then maybe we can learn to listen to these girls. And not only just listen, but to see if we can't hear. And if we can't hear, uh, then we've got to sit down with other people and say, you know, the girl said so-and-so and so-and-so, and, so and, so, and I got angry. I guess I really wasn't hearing what she's saying. Can anyone help me to hear perhaps what she was saying? So we admit that we can't hear, that's our problem and then get the kind of help we need, because we really are devoted to the girls' well-being, because if they do well, we do well, and if they don't do well, we don't really do well either. So I really don't have a prescription for it, because to me, life is not something that could be prescribed. But if you can learn to trust your own spontaneity, you'll do the right thing, spontaneously, if you learn to trust yourself. Is there any other question? I really have enjoyed this tremendous open discussion. Oh, yeah. You're all beautiful. Wow. There's a lot of Super. Fun.